Hello! Um, welcome to History 1301, uh, U.S. History 1301. This first chapter deals with uh, pretty much all of pre-Columbian U.S. history. Uh, so it's rather a lot of stuff to get into one chapter, and so we kind of just sort of skim over everything uh, a little bit. This is all pre-Columbian in America history. Uh, chapter 2 will touch a little bit on kind of what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, especially since it's all kind of interconnected. But anyway, this is how uh, sort of things are falling out in America uh, before you get European explorers coming along. Alright, so scholars hypothesize that after about 30,000 BCE, or before the Common Era, people from Siberia, following animals, uh, their food source, uh, as well as many other things, eventually crossed the Bering Strait into Alaska and uh, into sort of northern Canada, that kind of area. Around 10,000 BCE, a gap began to emerge in the ice sheets that were covering northern uh, that northern portion of America, and this created a passage for them to go through so that they could get down into what is now the Great Plains of the United States. Uh, very recently, skeletons from, sorry, skeletons dating from around 12,000 BCE or even earlier have been found, uh, and some archaeologists date skeletons found in Monteverde in Chile, which is on the southernmost tip of Chile to about 13,000 BCE. So they made uh, their way over and then southward quite early on. A few archaeologists think that some early Americans may have also crossed the Atlantic. Uh, oral tradition offers some conflicting support for these various theories, though. For example, the Pueblos and the Navajos tell of perilous journeys through other worlds before emerging from underground in the sort of American region uh, that they reside after that. Many natives insist that these kind of stories confirm the idea that they originated in the Western Hemisphere, but if you don't take the stories literally and rather take them more uh, metaphorically, the stories could also be more stylized descriptions of journeys through strange lands and therefore support the scientific theories that Native peoples came from elsewhere and traveled to North America. Uh, so it supports scientific theories rather than contradicts them. But uh, a lot of that is pure speculation at this point. The Paleolithic Revolution uh, is uh, the term used for describing when stone tools first began emerging uh, amongst early peoples and the Paleo-Indians uh, which is the archaeologist rather name for the earliest Americans, uh, kind of laid the foundation for Native American life uh, in the Western Hemisphere. They appear to have traveled within sort of well-defined hunting territories uh, and bands made up of several families, usually between 15 and 50 people. They occasionally left their territories and interacted with other bands where they would exchange ideas uh, intermarry, exchange goods, take part in religious ceremonies or otherwise uh, socially interact with one another. And most of the exchange system, uh, as far as we could tell, is done through uh, a sort of reciprocity type of an idea. These Paleo-Indians uh, exploited a variety of plant and animal foods, but initially focused most of their efforts on the large mammals, things like mammoths uh, and other things. These animals were something of a, uh, a one-stop shop for people. They could use the bones for tools as well as for structure uh, on dwellings. They could use the hides to make clothing and blankets and uh, coverings for tents. They would eat the meat. Uh, they could burn the fat. Uh, really, they could use pretty much everything that the animal had to offer. Around 9,000 BCE, however, these animals began dying out. Um, whether that had to do with climate change, which is entirely 
possible, or over hunting, which is also a possibility. Uh, it's it's still a little sketchy, but for whatever reason, uh, about 9,000 BC, these animals began to die off. Humans, however, greatly benefited from the end of the Ice Age, even though they lost those uh, those large mammals. Uh, people are much better suited to living in warm climates. Uh, as warming continued, uh, about 4000 BCE, you start to see some global effects. The water levels begin to rise noticeably, glaciers begin to melt and recede, uh, and so the environment changes pretty drastically. One of the more drastic changes in the environment that... Uh, we get in this hemisphere is that the ice which allows people to cross from Siberia to Alaska uh, melts and so now you have a sea there which is the dividing those two things. After about 8000 BCE people also had to begin modifying the way that they lived um, because they had lost those large animals uh, they've got a warmer climate now uh, and you have a changing environment um, they have to adapt to that. These people are called archaic people. Um, the sort of post-climate change people called archaic people. Uh, they tended to live off of the wilder varieties of plants and animals available. Um, they had more variety, which meant that communities required less land and could support larger populations as well as even a few permanent settlements. Archaic people honed their skills in harvesting wild plants, and through generations of observation, they even learned how to weed and prune and irrigate and transplant these plants, uh, and otherwise manipulate their environment to suit their needs. The most prolific of these peoples were in Mesoamerica, where they developed maize. By about 2500 BCE, most had moved beyond the ways of their archaic forebears, and the greatest change came when uh, people had managed to manipulate their environments in such a way that they could produce a surplus of food. Surpluses of food allowed for even larger populations and even smaller areas to spring up. Uh, and some of the more densely populated societies transformed into religious and political systems that linked several local communities. So you start to see the beginnings of the great sort of South American, Mesoamerican empires as we're going on. As farmers improved their practices and crops improved, higher yields uh, and better nutrition led to societies uh, that would center their lives around farming. They would trade their surpluses with non-farming neighbors. neighbors rather. Uh, they expanded those trade contracts contacts, sorry, into formal networks uh, and allowed them to acquire more wealth uh, and power than their partners. And some even began developing large urban centers. These sort of societies tended to be hierarchical in nature uh, with hereditary rulers who would claim kinship to deities in much the same way that Europeans uh, had absolute monarchs who claimed some relation to God or some kind of divine inspiration at least. Um, while the so kind of chieftains on this end of the globe were absolute rulers as well, they're often described as chiefdoms rather than states, nation states, which is what you get in Europe. Uh, and there's a very sort of subtle distinction between the two. Groups like the Aztecs and the Incas went on to create massive empires. Uh, mobile hunting, fishing, gathering bands did persist in areas where food was relatively scarce, however. So you don't see uh, overall everything changing all at once. You get sort of pockets of urbanization and technological improvement and then pockets that uh, are still a bit more primitive. The picture you can see here on the bottom is a look at maize, at the, the development of maize. Essentially, maize or corn was uh, one of the first examples we have of genetically modified foods. Um, 
in that it started out as a rather small and simple looking grass, as the, the picture on the far left uh, indicates, and through various sort of interbreeding and, and various other forms of manipulation, uh, the Native Americans were able to create something a bit more substantial uh, and maize itself, the creation of it, was extremely helpful to growing populations as it was one of the more nutritious foods that they had on offer to them. So the capital of the largest early state was Teotihuacan. Forgive me if I'm saying that incorrectly. It's entirely possible that I am. Uh, and this is, uh, is near present-day New Mexico. Sorry, Mexico City, not New Mexico City. Uh, the population numbered at least 100,000 people between the 2nd and 7th century CE. CE meaning Common Era, or the era that we're in now, formally referred to as AD. Uh, it was one of the largest cities in the world at the time, uh, at its height. It uh, featured a large sort of complex of pyramids. In the center with the Pyramid of the Sun, uh, the one pictured being the largest. Trade networks uh, from this city extended over much of what is now modern-day Mexico. Um, however, it began uh, to decline somewhat in the 8th century. Despite that decline, though, it did have a great impact on neighboring uh, communities that began growing up afterwards. Teotihuacan had the greatest influence on its southern neighbors, the Maya, who flourished in uh, sort of southern Mexico around the Yucatan, as well as Central America, to all the way to Honduras. Uh, and they flourished between the 7th and 15th centuries. They are probably most well known for developing a calendar. In fact, we had a scare a couple of years ago that the world was going to end in 2012 because the Mayan calendar ended in 2012. Um, the fact that we're sitting here, you're sitting here listening to this indicates that the world didn't in fact end as they predicted. Um, but they also had uh, a numeric system, a phonetic as well as a hieroglyphic writing system, uh, and uh, the development of books. So they are very uh, rather advanced society, probably even on par with uh, societies like the ancient Egyptians. Other powerful states also began to flourish, uh, and two empires in particular rose up to challenge them. So the Aztecs um, were originally a much uh, smaller community. They migrated north in the 13th century and settled on the shores of Lake Texcoco as uh, the subjects of the local inhabitants there. They uh, weren't particularly happy with that uh, position, however, uh, because in 1428 they overthrew their rulers and went on to conquer other cities around the lake and all the way even to the Gulf, Gulf Coast, uh, managing to gain control of much of central Mexico. During a four-year drought in the 1450s, the Aztecs concluded that their gods were also hungry, and so the priests maintained that the only way to satisfy them was with human blood and hearts. After that, uh, the conquering warriors sought captives for sacrifice, and so it kind of changed the nature of the Aztec Empire. And in fact, on Blackboard, in, uh, in a folder, where I have various little videos and things like that, uh, I have a uh, an interesting song, I guess, um, from a history sketch comedy children's show um, that they air in Britain, and it, it talks about Aztec sacrifice uh, and those sorts of things. So uh, give that uh, a look if you get a chance or if you're all interested. In order to support all of this uh, sort of expanding human sacrifice practice, they built a very large temple complex in their capital, which is Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan. Again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Uh, and it was this complex that was formed the sort of sacred center of the empire around this complex. There were nearly 200,000 people living in and around the capital city, and in order to support them, 
Uh, the Aztecs maximized their food production. Uh, they drained the swamps to create cropland, uh, developed irrigation systems, and, uh, and other techniques to, uh, to grow the food necessary to support 200,000 people. Taxes were also collected within 100 miles, and those further afield played tribute. So taxes are collected on an individual basis, meaning an individual person would pay them. Tribute is collected from cities. So the various cities that were outside of that 100-mile radius would pay tribute to the Aztec Empire. But it's the entire city, not individual citizens of it, that paid the tribute. They also had uh, really large trade networks that extended well beyond the empire and were conducted by people called the Pachteca, or traders, who would travel in armed caravans, much, I imagine, like you would uh, picture sort of going across the Silk Road uh, and the Sahara and things like that. It's a very similar idea. These Aztec traders, though, traded for things like salt, uh, cacao, jewelry, feathers, jaguar pelts, uh, cotton, precious stones, and gold. The Aztec Empire was still expanding in the 16th century, uh, but rebellions are becoming a constant problem for the empire. However, their local struggles are very soon to be replaced by a much more substantial threat in the form of the arrival of the Spanish. The Incas also rose up right around the same time uh, as the Aztecs and also went about conquering societies, this time in South America over much of the Andes mountain regions and adjacent regions after 1438. So pretty much the exact same time frame that the Aztecs are on the rise. The Incas are also on the rise in the same folder that I have the, uh, the Aztec video. I also have a few Inca videos, which uh, are very interesting. One of the keys to the expansion of the Inca Empire was their ability to produce and distribute a wide variety of surplus crops. They managed to construct terraced irrigation facilities, utilize freeze drying and other forms of preservation, and built massive storage houses and a huge network of roads and bridges to move food and supplies from one corner of the empire to the other. Uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, a Disney film that came out quite a while ago now, uh, it's called The Emperor's New Groove. He's a, an Inca emperor uh, in that film. And, uh, and while it is Disney, and, and Disney has uh, sort of questionable as far as historical accuracy goes. It does give you some idea as to the scale of the empire uh, and things like that. Also, it's a really cute movie, so I, I would just recommend it for that. Uh, like the Aztec, the Inca were also still expanding when the Spanish came and uh, caused a, a rather sudden halt to all of that expansion. And uh, it's interesting to think about, although impossible to really guess exactly what would have happened had uh, the Aztec and Inca had more friendly relations with the Spanish, uh, or if the Spanish hadn't come at all, what sort of uh, changes that would make to history as it exists. So while the Aztec and the Inca were probably by far the more interesting uh, and definitely the largest uh, civilizations to spring up in the Western Hemisphere, you do still have some much more mysterious, I suppose, civilizations, large civilizations springing up in the northern part of the Western Hemisphere. And I say mysterious because we don't know quite as much about them as we do the Aztec and the Inca. The Southwest is a uniformly arid region. Uh, we're talking about New Mexico, Arizona type region. And uh, water, getting water has always been the biggest problem for settlements there. Despite that though, you do still have societies there which support farming. Uh, maize managed to sort of travel up from the kind of Mesoamerican civilizations uh, 
uh, and reached the southwest around 2500 BCE, but farming didn't really catch on in the region until about 400 BCE when they found a much more drought-resistant strain of maize. Uh, so the initial idea, if you like, of maize traveled up from those uh, early sort of Mexican settle, uh, civilizations. But it had to continue to be modified in order to fit the climate of the Southwest. And so that was what they did uh, there. The Hohokam were one of the more influential uh, societies in the Southwest United States, modern United States. Uh, after the establishment of agriculture, they emerged around 300 CE in the Common Era, uh, several centuries after farming was introduced. They managed to build fairly intricate irrigation canals using coordinated workforces. Uh, they had permanent towns and some even joined together in confederations that were connected by the various canals. There would be a central village that acted as a kind of capital, but it wasn't quite as organized as the Aztec Empire, the Incan Empire, um, and that it was less hierarchical, much uh, much more of an even uh, sort of plane, I guess, between the different uh, societies and communities within the Confederation. They drew a lot on the culture of, uh, of Mesoamerica as well as materials and ideas um, because they were actively trading with the Aztec Empire. You had the Pochtaka who would come up and do business with uh, societies like the Hohokam. From the 6th century, large villages had ball courts and platform mounds like those that you would find in Mesoamerica. And artifacts of Mesoamerican origin have also been found on Hohokam sites, meaning that they would buy sort of crafts uh, and things like that from the merchants as well. The ancestral Pueblo uh, originated around year one in the Common Era in what's now known as the Four Corners region. Uh, it's where Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah sort of meet uh, and that region there was where they first began to spring up. By 700 CE, they were harvesting regular crops, living in permanent villages, and creating pottery. They expanded to become one of the most powerful people in the Southwest uh, and are best distinguished by their architecture, which you can see in the picture here. The culture itself reached its height between 900 and 1150, uh, during what was really an unusually wet period for the southwestern United States. They managed to forge a confederation between 12 large towns with roughly 15,000 people. There were roads that connected the town, interestingly enough, perfectly straight roads, which would indicate some uh, sort of rudimentary mathematical system in place. They had carved stairs, they would build canals, and they would build dams to control water flow and various things like that. Uh, Pueblo Bonita was the largest of these uh, 12 large towns and it had a population of around 1,200 people and served as a major trade center with Mesoamerica, the Great Plains, the Mississippi Valley, as well as California. Uh, so groups from all these different regions would come here and trade with the Pueblo. Notice, though, that those numbers, uh, 12 large towns, all 12 of them supported roughly 15,000 people compared to just one urban center uh, for the Aztecs supporting over 200,000 people. So it's a much smaller scale civilization forming in uh, the northern part of the Western Hemisphere. Both the, the Pueblo and the Hohokam began their decline in the 12th or 13th century, largely due to drought. So unlike in the southwest, the peoples of the eastern woodlands had abundant water, uh, as well as forests to provide a very rich variety of food sources, uh, and plenty of rivers that would facilitate long-distance travel. Many peoples there established rather populous villages and complex confederations. Um, if we think about uh, groups like the Iroquois Confederation, uh, which sprung up initially in this eastern woodland area, 
By 1200 BCE, there were about 5,000 or so people living at Poverty Point in Louisiana. This community featured earthen works, uh, including large mounds and concentric embankments. The center of a larger political and economic unit imported large quantities of quartz, uh, copper, obsidian, crystal, and other substances from very long distances. Uh, the design suggests that there was some Olmec influence from Mesoamerica, uh, which also indicates that they had some contact with, uh, with traders from Mesoamerica as well. And they flourished for about three centuries uh, and then began to decline for reasons that are still unknown to us, actually. And uh, I believe the top picture is a an image of Poverty Point. Other mound builders also emerged in Adena in Ohio around 400 BCE. They were much smaller than the Poverty Point community. Uh, they spread over a wide area and built hundreds of mounds, often with graves inside of them. Uh, their treatment of the dead indicates different social or political status, uh, kind of based on how individuals are buried. After about 100 BCE, they evolved into a much more complex culture, which became known as the Hopewell, and spread across the uh, Ohio Valley all the way to the Illinois River Valley. The elite in this society were buried with thousands of freshwater pearls, uh, various ornaments made of copper and other precious metals, as well as other items originating from locales throughout America. Trade routes also saw the Hopewell religious practices and technologies spread to faraway communities as well. The Hopewell cinders, uh, again, were mysteriously abandoned by about 600 BCE. Despite this fact, though, they also had enormous influence on later developments uh, in the area as well. The little statuette at uh, the bottom there is uh, an example of craftsmanship from this particular group uh, of the Hopewell. The Mississippi River was the primary location for early agricultural societies. And by CE 700, they had developed a new culture, which became known as the Mississippian culture. They had uh, craft production and long distance travel, which dwarfed that of the Hopewell and the Adena, which were operating in the Ohio and in the Illinois River Valley. Sorry. Uh, the centers, city centers housed hundreds or thousands of people and were built up around open plazas and platform mounds topped with religious temples much like you would see in Mesoamerica. After about CE 900, uh, centers formed extensive networks based on riverborne trade and shared religious beliefs, with the most powerful of these being Chahokia, located near what is today St. Louis, Missouri, and is uh, represented somewhat stylistically in the bottom picture. This center housed around 20,000 people in about a 125 square mile city. After 1200 though, the Chauke and other centers began to experience shortages as they had overtaxed the rather fragile environment uh, around the city center. And scarce resources led to debilitating warfare and the survivors very soon fled and abandoned the city. Despite the decline, Mississippian culture also had a profound effect on eastern tribes. Mounds and other earthen works didn't really catch on, but life for the Iroquois and others came to similarly revolve around village-based farming. Land management practices were environmentally sound and economically productive, uh, as they learned from the mistakes of the earlier civilizations. They tended to burn hardwood forests, uh, removing much of the underbrush and enhancing the hunting uh, because those burned over tracks would favor the growth of grass and berry bushes, which attracted various game animals. They also cleared fields to plant crops, 
in uh, the ash-enriched soil, and they would plant until yields declined, and then they would move the society, sort of just pick up the whole village, and start over again somewhere else. The ground cover would grow back eventually, restoring fertility naturally, uh, and eventually the village would move back to the original location uh, and re-farm it. It was not in the most efficient system as it involved sort of picking it up and moving everybody uh, every so often, but uh, it worked for them fairly well. All right, so outside of the southwest and the eastern sort of woodland area, farming tended to be either impossible because the environment didn't allow for it or impractical because it was much easier to get food from the environment which provided it. Uh, for example, in the Northwest, sort of Alaska, all the way down to Northern California, people tended to settle in fishing villages on the coast, and that made up the majority of their diet. Most of these villages were permanent, um, as they had access to both fresh and saltwater sea life, as well as land animals and plants, uh, which was perfectly substantial for their diets. By CE1, uh, by year one, villages were housing several hundred people. Uh, many were living in sort of multi-family houses. Uh, they had trade uh, and warfare, which strengthened the power of the elites. And they tended to display their wealth by having potlucks, uh, essentially, which were, were feasts where they basically gave food away. <laughs> Um, to guests or they would destroy them uh, because the accumulation of wealth uh, for Native American populations it tended to denote uh, a kind of failure uh, in life rather than success. Um, success was when you accumulated wealth and then were able to share it uh, amongst everybody else and so they would have these dinners uh, where they could give things away and if they couldn't give things away then they would destroy them which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, the Inuits and Alouettes uh, came to the region with relatively sophisticated tools and weapons that they brought with them from Siberia. They arrived after 3000 BCE, so much later than uh, the groups that made their way down to sort of South America and, uh, and the rest of sort of North America. They also maintained contact uh, with Siberia, and it was in fact through the Inuits and their contact that they maintained, uh, sort of across the Bering Straits, that introduced the bow and arrow to North America first. Uh, it spread across Canada uh, and over to Greenland and then in south as well. People further south uh, on the California coast were also gathering into villages uh, of about a hundred or so. They often gathered things like acorns, which tended to be highly nutritious and, and very easy to store uh, as well. Competition for acorns, uh, interestingly enough, increased. Uh, and so you see a lot of villages combining into chiefdoms, and you have chiefs, which conducted trade and diplomacy and war and religious ceremonies between a number of villages. These aren't on the same scale as empires like the Aztecs or the Inca, even though they have the same kind of basic look about them. Essentially, you have a dominant village and then satellite villages, which sort of pay tribute to that dominant village, and they live under the auspices of that chief. Uh, it's on a much, much smaller scale in California. The plains and sort of desert uh, areas of the interior were far too dry to support large settlements, uh, and people here tended to remain sort of mobile hunting gathering bands, uh, much like their archaic forebears. Uh, nothing really changed very much with how they lived. Uh, and they also tended to be in relatively small bands, 50 being probably about the largest. Hunters pursued mainly kind of big game type animals like antelope, deer, elk, bear, buffalo. And they would use everything from these animals. They would eat the meat, they would make clothing, bedding, houses, uh, any of that from the hide, kettles, shields, uh, everything else from the bone and the horns. Uh, so they never 
wasted really any of the animal. You have joining these bands refugees from failed settlements uh, like the Kaukia and elsewhere moving into the sort of lower river valleys of the plains. In that area because you have the river systems they could cultivate crops uh, and so they could build year-long villages um, but definitely on a much smaller scale. Uh, they also hunted buffalo and other animals for sort of sources of protein. The Great Basin grew much warmer and much drier uh, and foods that were previously available uh, like waterfowl, like duck uh, and other things started to disappear which tended to limit the already scarce food sources uh, and this is after about 1200 or so. People began to rely very heavily on things like nuts uh, to get them through as far as sources of protein went. Hunting picked up again uh, around 500 CE, sorry that was 1200 BCE, uh, 500 CE hunting begins to pick up again when the bow and arrow uh, makes its way down and is introduced. The earliest contact that many uh, in, the, in the sort of North America region had with Europeans happened around 980 uh, in CE when you have Viking sort of Norse explorers uh, from Scandinavia coming and colonizing Greenland and sort of exploring around in the sort of upper reaches of Canada and places like that. They tended to hunt furs, uh, they collected timber, they traded quite freely with Inuit groups and others uh, in that uh, sort of far north area of uh, Canada or what's now Canada. They made several attempt, uh, attempts uh, around about 1000 CE to colonize uh, what they called Vinland uh, or what's now Newfoundland. Um, they initially had sort of good relations with the, the tribe that inhabited that land uh, already, but encounters soon became contentious and eventually the Norse just withdrew from Vinland uh, rather than pursue it. They stayed on Greenland, uh, however, and sort of colonies until around about the 1480s uh, or so. And uh, there's also some evidence that uh, supports the possibility of other people making contact uh, with natives in North America. There is uh, some evidence that archaeologists have used to claim that visitors from Phoenicia uh, or Northern Africa essentially made it uh, to sort of Central America uh, and the Caribbean, uh, visiting there long, long before Europeans uh, and definitely long, long before Columbus made his way over. Uh, there's also some supposition that uh, people actually managed to make it across the Pacific, uh, as in fact that's at least part of the theory as to how people ended up on the islands of Hawaii. And so uh, it's entirely possible that contact between uh, Native Americans and the rest of the world was not quite so unheard of as, uh, as we've traditionally liked to believe. The last thing uh, that we'll cover in Chapter 1 uh, deals largely with the culture uh, that we see in Native American societies. By about 1500, the Western Hemisphere has a population of around 75 million people. Most of that population is centered in Mezzo and South America, with about 7 to 10 million in North America. Trade between the various regions tended to facilitate um, not only the exchange of goods, but also technologies and ideas uh, among various groups, so that certain practices actually became standard throughout. Um, all of the Americas, things like the cultivation of corn, uh, at least among agricultural societies. Native Americans also, uh, as an example, tended to, to bind themselves together primarily through kinship groups. Um, biological ties were used to create sort of complex societal patterns. 
the nuclear family was usually never on its own, uh, but tended to live as part of sort of multi-generational extended family where you would have uh, aunts and uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, uh, cousins, so on, all kind of living in one uh, sort of little band or household. Uh, in societies like the Iroquois, extended families um, were matriarchal in nature uh, rather than patriarchal, meaning that women tended to take precedent uh, within the families. For example, new husbands would move in with their wife's family uh, rather than the other way around, which is what tends to dominate in European society. Uh, and others, though, that wasn't, uh, that was the Iroquois, and, and there are some others who are like that, uh, but you also have patriarchal societies uh, in, amongst Native, Native Americans. And then you have still others who uh, don't care one way or the other. Uh, there's no real distinction made. Uh, as far as amongst uh, the sexes. Kinship also tended to be the basis for conflict uh, among Native Americans. Murder was usually resolved by extended families uh, of the victim and the perpetrator, essentially fighting over it. Um, if it wasn't settled between the two, then political leaders might step in to try and resolve it, uh, or else you might see revenge through open armed conflict. Uh, these kind of blood feuds could escalate into community wars relatively easily. Uh, you also see the same kind of practice amongst uh, Vikings uh, and amongst various Germanic groups in Europe uh, as well, these kind of blood feud type conflicts. Uh, the potential for war also tended to grow as populations grew. Um, Despite that, though, warfare still remained fairly minimal, uh, largely because the aim in warfare was not necessarily to inflict as many casualties as possible or to conquer land, but rather to capture your enemy and to humiliate them. Quite often, people who were captured in warfare were made part of the tribe that captured them. Uh, they were sort of assimilated in rather than, uh, than executed or, or something like that. So you have a different mindset. Uh, with regards to warfare than you do in Europe especially. Women also tended to do most of the cultivating in farm societies, uh, especially in places like the Southwest, uh, or sorry, accepting places like the Southwest where responsibility tended to be shared. Um, because of this, because they essentially produced the greatest share of the food supply, uh, they also tended to gain rather power in those communities. And so those are going to be your matriarchal communities largely. Religions in Native America tended to revolve around uh, the conviction that all nature was alive with spiritual power. Um, they would try to sort of conciliate these spiritual forces uh, through praying, uh, praying to the animals that they hunted, uh, asking for their pardon and thanking them for the food. They could gain access to spiritual power through dreams and visions, but also through physical ordeals. Uh, physical ordeals that uh, I'm sure were often quite painful <laughs> as well. Uh, entire communities could practice collective rituals, uh, like a sun dance uh, or something like that. As you see most often on Great Plains tribes. Uh, societies demanded fairly strong degrees of cooperation amongst their members. Um, they sought unity usually through consensus rather than tolerating divisions for any amount of time. Uh, they reinforced cooperation through the sense of, of sort of order, uh, customs, the sort of difficulty, the environment, things like that all tended to help regulate everyday life as well. Familial or community revenge, these kind of blood feuds, were usually seen as a sort of ritualized way of restoring order. Uh, so if you do something to wrong my family, then my family has to do something to essentially make up for that. Uh, once that's done, then we're even and we can move on. Uh, depending on, I suppose, the severity of the opening act. Reciprocity was also fairly central 
um, and was aimed at maintaining a kind of equilibrium as well as a certain amount of interdependence among individuals who would quite often have unequal amounts of power within the community. Uh, a leader's authority or a chief's authority depended largely on obligations that were bestowed rather than coercion. Uh, they would essentially gather up favors, if you like. They would distribute gifts that would obligate other members to respect their authority. So, like I say, essentially buying favors. Uh, the same sort of principles govern relations between the different societies as well, so villages might uh, operate that way, and especially chiefdoms would operate that way. Although they did have a lot in common, Native Americans never really saw themselves as a single group of people. Uh, it was only really with the arrival of Europeans and the emphasis on the difference between Europeans and Native uh, Americans that that particular viewpoint began to change. Uh, it's when you get the arrival of essentially the common other, which essentially unites uh, the Native American tribes into um, seeing themselves as kind of all in the same boat, although that does take some time as well.